Welcome back to Learn SKN, and today we're going to continue looking at the May June 2019 paper 2 for Agricultural Science CSEC. CSEC Agricultural Science paper 2, May June 2019. And we looked at questions 1, 2, 3 before, and so you can look at that those previous videos for that one. So today we're going to be looking at question 4, but you know what to do before we jump into it. You have to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you know when Learn SKN drops another video from this paper. Also, note that you can purchase the Agriculture Science Package with some past papers and some notes and some textbooks and some other things built into one package. You can purchase that from the description below for just five US dollars. You can purchase those that pack to help you study for your subject. All right, well, let's just jump into it right now. So Farmer Steve cultivates tomatoes on a clay soil. He observed that during the harvest, in the rainy season, the fruits have cracks and splitting skins. The extension officer visits his farm and identifies that too much water is the cause of the problem. State three cultural practices Farmer Steve can use to address the problem of excess water. So cultural practices, excess water. Let's see how we can resolve that one. And so if you take a look in our textbook, we see a whole lot of you know soil maintenance tactics. And one of them would be cultural practices. And under these cultural practices, we have molding, tillage, drainage, irrigation, mulching. And so right off the bat, you can tell which ones can be more applicable to you know using getting the what excess water from the soil and so we have molding now molding is where you put the you scrape some soil around the roots of the plant and mold will help with the drainage of excess water so that's one way you can do that by molding then you have drainage of course you're gonna you're gonna have to have proper drainage in your production area so that the clay soil the water can run off and not settle right there so drainage is another way in which you can use to reduce the amount of water that's in the soil. Instead of it being clogged, because of course it's, it's clay soil, so it's going to be waterlogged. You find a way for the water to run off drift, uh, and run off or run out of the soil so you can have enough water to prevent the splitting of the fruits. Then you have mulching. So mulching is where you put you know, something on the surface of the soil. It could be bagasse, it could be debris, whatever. Mulching has a dual purpose. One, well, you have more than dual purpose. Mulching can, but in this particular case, mulching can be used to add organic matter to the soil when it breaks down. And when you add organic matter to, to soil, like clay soil, then it becomes, it has the ability to drain water, improves its overall structure of the soil, improves when you add organic matter. And so too much water would not be accumulated in the clay soil, it would drain out some of the water easily. But apart from that, the mulching can also absorb some of the moisture, right? It can also absorb some of the moisture. So instead of having the water all around in the soil, you can absorb some of the moisture based on which one you use for mulching. And then that would in turn reduce some of the amount of water in the soil that the plants have access to. So that's another way. Then of course we have irrigation. Irrigation is a cultural practice. And of course you know that if it's the rainy time, then you should alter your irrigation method to match the time so you don't want to go and have you know sprinkler or whatever to water your plants knowing that it's already raining season and it's clay soil so you want to have proper irrigation to maintain that particular level of water in the soil so you have those practices and you can outline how they can help with this particular problem that the farmer is facing with excess water so anyone, any tree, you get your tree max for that one. All right, B. Neela is a plant breeder who wants to breed a red stem celery plant. To achieve this, she crosses two plants with the RNI gene for red stem color. The offspring of, the, of this cross is called the F1 generation, right? So you have your dominant gene, you have your recessive gene right there. So the F1 generation. No. Complete the table to show the genotype of the F1 generation. So you have your so you have your Punnett square right here, Punnett square right here, and so they are saying to fill it out. This is not the actual question. Sorry, let me go back to the question. This is the actual paper from the book. 
right there is blank so let's not get it to say it's blank at first but i'm going to just do it in so you can see i'm going to fill it in for you so it's blank so you have uh you have the dominant gene recessive dominant recessive and so the answer would be this one here so first let's see how we, we do it now so you know i'm going to start with the dominant gene which is always the capital one the capital one is a dominant gene so the big r is a dominant gene the small one is a recessive gene and so you that's the first one and then you start with this section over here first so you you you, you bring you bring down this one you bring on the r bring across the r so you have two r in there so you have a dominant right there so you have two r's in here two large dominant genes for red right so you have it right there then you go to the right so you have the big r here right and then you have the small one here so you bring across this one bring on this one and you have the r big r small r then you have the small r here and then like i said the dominant is the one that takes precedence so you bring on this one bring across this one you have a big r small r and then here you have two small r two recessive, recessive r genes so it's one two so you have the two r down there good that's how we get that done the opponent square so you fill out that like this and you should get your two marks for that one very straightforward very simple now i said to calculate the percent of plants that will be heterozygous for red stem color heterozygous for red stem color and heterozygous means that you have two different alleles two different alleles right they're different so it's either you have a bigger where really you have the bigger or the smaller that's how they are different and so you realize that these two homogeneous they're the same r and r the same r and r the same big, big small small big big they're the same so those two are out those are homo homozygous so the heterozygous now would be those that are different hetero means different so you have the one two and so the percentage percentage would be of course 50 50 right it's a 50 50 chance that the there might be a heterozygous output because you have well let's let me rephrase so there's 25 25 each of them represents a 25 percent chance right there so calculate the percentage that the plants will be heterozygous but because this one is hetero this one is hetero you have a 50 percent chance that the plant might be heterozygous individually it will be 25 but for heterozygous or homozygous it's 50 50 either way because it can be this one or that one this one or that one 50 50 all right good good so that's it so a 50 percent chance that they might be heterozygous for the red stem color and the red stem color would be r bigger small r okay good moving right along so that's a one mark there all right good the last one for this question Genetic engineering is used to produce crops such such as extended shelf life tomatoes. Explain two ways in which farmers can benefit from growing genetically modified crops. Okay, so this is a very tricky question. Tri tricky question, not tricky question, but a tricky situation. A lot of people have issues with GMOs and things like that. But let's say okay, give two ways in which farmers can benefit. So let's go one. Gen genetically modified crops can have higher yields, right? So that's higher yields. If they have higher yields, then by all means, the farmer might make more money, right? So, one, the plant would have higher yields as they are modified, and you might have more money because of that. Higher yields in terms of more, and also in terms of larger. Good, that's one advantage, right? One benefit of growing GMOs. Next one would be resistance. The plants might be resistant to certain pests and diseases, so that's the next advantage right there. They might be resistant to certain pests and diseases that they have been modified to be resistant to. So that's the next way in the, that's the next way in which you can benefit from that. And of course, there's one right there in the stem. It said genetic engineering is used to produce crops such as, such as extended shelf life tomatoes. Good. So that means that the plant, the 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 the, the product can last longer on the shelf right, the, right there it's in the stem it can last longer on the shelf because again resistance to certain things also next advantage the plants the crops can be planted 
at different time of year, such as because there are some crops that are modified to be, let's say, drought resistant or heat resistant or flood resistant, things like that. So all of a sudden now, you have plants that can go longer within the year because whereas you know, you might have not, not, might not have had enough water because the rainy season finished, they can go longer because they're resistant to their heat tolerance and things like that. So there are a lot of difference to the lot of advantages of going genetically modified. And next one would be that a lot of the plants might be uniformed, right? In terms of their output, their yields, it might be uniform. They might get the same size pumpkin, the same size watermelon, whatever. And that might be really attractive. When it comes to marketing, that might be more attractive to customers. Speaking of attractive, that's the next point I can make. When you use genetically modified crops, they can be more attractive in terms of their look, their appearance, because of their being modified as such. Some plants may be modified to grow to a certain size, a certain width, certain diameter, certain color, because there are many plants out there that are genetically modified to have fancy colors, and that can be a selling point for the farmers right there. Right? So it can be beneficial to them because it can be different, sell it based on the look, you know, red, this, orange, and pink, purple. Even seedless, you know, some crop, crops have been modified to become seedless, and as such, they they can fetch a higher price. Another advantage is that we're going along with the resistant strain also. If a plant is resistant to certain pesticides or certain pests and diseases, then a farmer can save money on inputs because they can save money on buying all of these pests. I mean these pesticides and herbicides and things like that they would need to tend to the crops because the crops are naturally resistant not naturally but they are modified to be resistant and so you can save money so all those are examples that I've outlined that can be beneficial to a farmer if they start growing genetically modified crops all right good so that's it for this question the number four for the mid June 2019 Agriculture Science CSEC Paper 2. So that's it for question 4. So you know what to do now. Like the video, subscribe to the channel so you know when Learn SKN drops question 5 and question 6 for this paper. Alright? Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening.